He'll tell you more about what he's going to say, but a brief bio of Don here that he gave me. He came to MSU in the Department of Humanities in 1965, coming from the University of Maryland, where he wrote his MA thesis on Shakespeare, and his doctoral dissertation, I like this, on some deservedly obscure 17th century poetry. <laughs> he confirms what I've always thought about 17th century poetry. <laughs> He greatly enjoyed his education in the humanities from the ancient Greeks, Camus and Einstein. Einstein's a humanist, I guess so. Sure. He thinks his best students were in the natural sciences. When the Department of Humanities was dissolved in 1992, he became professor of English literature, teaching Shakespeare and Milton until he retired in 2004. He still leads an annual pilgrimage to the Stratford Shakespeare Festival for the MSU Friends of Theater, where he speaks on the season's plays. So we're happy here to have Don to talk to us about an interesting play of Shakespeare's, rather different than the others. He'll explain it. Uh, Don Gutsberg. This may be the uh, only time I've worn a necktie <laughs> uh, to this series by Joan got me a Shakespeare tie. <laughs> and so what I had to wear to match it. So here I am. Uh, I have a big voice. Uh, Bruce very thoughtfully provided a microphone and a central lectern. But if I'm too loud or too soft, it's a pretty big room. Let me know. Uh, as far as a trip to Stratford, there are itineraries at the back by the coffee for those who are interested. We usually fill the bus by late June, I guess. It will be Labor Day weekend this year, which is very good for some people and impossible for others. That's what it is. Um, let's remember, oh, <laughs> I won't do that again. Um, theater began with religion, like so many other cultural institutions. And we place it in ancient Greece probably the Greece, Greeks copied somebody else when they <laughs> use the word classic they meant Egypt but anyway we place it with the Greeks uh, and theater specifically drama came from the worship of the fertility god Dionysus known to the Romans as Bacchus so even the highly rationalized tragedies of Aeschylus and Sophocles and Euripides were first performed at a festival which began with an animal sacrifice, usually a goat, to Dionysus. And the comedies, particularly those of Aristophanes, those are the ones that have primarily come down to us, both the Greek and Roman comedies are even closer to their Dionysian or Bacchanalian origins. Pretty wild, pretty X-rated in many cases. <laughs> The Romans, of course, copied the Greek theater, but Greco-Roman drama ended at least in the West with the fall of Rome in the 5th century. Remember in 410, Alaric and the Visigoths sacked Rome, and it was never the same after that. <laughs> uh, that's the 5th century of the Common Era. Uh, but drama revived around the 10th century through the church. When I say the church in this lecture, I mean, at least until we get to Shakespeare, which will be very soon, I mean the Church of Rome. Uh, because that was it in the West until uh, the 16th century. And it developed especially through the Mass, which is in itself, when you think about it, those of you who are Catholics, a very theatrical event. Things happen. Things change magically, uh, and especially at Easter time, mm -hmm. which uh, was the most, well, primary festival. We focus in the West on Christmas, but the Eastern Church's Easter is still the big event. And Easter is particularly appropriate because like the story of Dionysus, it concerns a god dies, goes under the ground, and then is reborn. Comes back. So it's a real parallel. Forgive me if there are any priests in the crowd. Um, 
And to uh, that is an anthropologist would certainly call it a parable. So I'm going to do a little, I don't have a robe with me, a little Easter Mass here, a little part of the Easter Mass. And it, it's in Latin, but I'll give it to you in English. And it's a 10th century account, a letter by Ethelwald, Bishop of Winchester in England, who's giving the priest the stage directions for how he wants this part of the Mass to be done. And the Mass is probably around very long, longer than you'd expect it today. Uh, uh, it's called Quem Quiritus, Quem Quiritus in Sepulchre. Whom do you seek in the sepulchre, O followers of Christ? Okay. Here's from the letter. While the third lesson is being chanted, let four brethren, priests, vest, there are a lot of priests in the 10th century, let four brethren vest themselves. Let one of these vested in an owl, that's a white gown, enter as though to take part in the service and let him approach the sepulcher without attracting attention and sit there quietly with a palm branch in his hand. While the third respond is chanted, let the remaining three follow, and let them all, vested in copes, non-white robes, uh, bearing in their hands thurbells with incense. The, that's that um, heavy pot-like with holes <laughs> where the smoking incense comes mm -hmm. through. Thurbells with incense, and stepping delicately, delicately as those who seek something approach the sepulchre. These things are done in imitation of the angel sitting in the monument, that, that would be a tomb, and the women with spices coming to anoint the body of Jesus. The three women would be the three Marys, Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary, mother of Jesus, and Mary, Martha, sister, I don't know. Um, when therefore he who sits there beholds the three approach him, like folk lost in seeking something, let him begin in a dulcet voice of medium pitch to sing. Quem coritis in sepulchre, whom do you seek in the sepulchre, O followers of Christ? And when he is sung it to the end, let the three reply in unison, Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, O celestial one. So he, that is the one of the white, he's not here. He is risen as he foretold. Go, announce that he's risen from the dead. At the word of this bidding, let those three turn to the quiet. Notice, they don't turn to the congregation, you guys. They turn to the choir to preserve the illusion, the way actors never look you in the eye. They say, is anybody out there? No. You know, you know. So they turn to the choir. It's a play. And say, Alleluia, the Lord is risen today, the strong lion, Christ the Son of God, unto God give thanks. Alleluia. This said, let the one still sitting there, and as if recalling them, say the anthem, come and see the place where the Lord was laid. Alleluia, Alleluia. And saying this, let him rise and lift the veil and show them the place, bare of a cross, but only the cloths laid there in which the cross had been wrapped. Go quickly and tell the disciples that the Lord is risen. Alleluia, alleluia. And when they have seen this, let them set down the thurbles which they bear into that same sepulcher and take the cloth and hold it up in the face of the clergy for the same reason, and as if to demonstrate that the Lord has risen and is no longer wrapped therein, let them sing the anthem, the Lord is risen from the sepulcher who for us was hanged on the cross, alleluia, and lay the cloth upon the altar. When the anthem is done, let the prior, sharing in the gladness at the triumph of our king and that having vanquished death, he rose again, begin the hymn, Te Deum, Laudamus, and this begun, 
all the bells chime out together. And you, when, the, when you are in a medieval church and the bells are chiming, you hear the reverberates around the stone. Now, all the basic elements of a play are here. Action physical, coming into the tomb. Action psychological, from doubt and despair to joyful certainty. Impersonators, actors, the priest pretending to be an angel, pretending to be the three Marys. Scenery, the place bare of the cross. Stage props, the angel's palm branch. Costumes, copes, and alley. Gestures, stepping delicately as those who seek something. Even sound effects, all the bells chime out together. Okay, now, so much for liturgical drama. We have less than an hour and we've got to cover a lot of centuries. <laughs> Eventually, drama within the church walls became embarrassing to the church. You can picture for weeks the young priests that were too busy to get confession, they're rehearsing their lines, who gets to play Jesus, whatever. Uh, uh, it caused too much, and, and we have accounts of that too, it, it got too rowdy. It, it caused too much like graduation in the football stadium. It caused too much distraction from the solemnity of the liturgical occasions, particularly Easter. So in 1210, Pope Innocent III banished drama from the in church interior, from the liturgy itself. So what do you do? You take it to the church porch after the service, mm -hmm. and then into the yard, uh, which could get tricky. Remember, in uh, medieval churches, the church yard is, is all graves. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and finally, into the town, and who's in, who really runs things in the town? in the Middle Ages, it's the guilds. Mm -hmm. The guilds could take charge, probably first the religious guilds, uh, but ultimately the trade and craft guilds. You know, uh, before the Kiwanis and the Rotary, they were all of the trade, the Acopagus Guild, and the Bricklayers Guild, and the Shipwrights Guild, and so forth. Now, since Easter, the original liturgical inspiration for Christian drama was still a pretty chilly season, at least in England, where I'm focused here. The performances gradually shifted to the rec recently established holiday of Corpus Christi Day, Body of Christ Day, the Thursday after the eighth Sunday after Easter, that is 60 days after Easter. So it's warmer, obviously, although it used to be warmer. <laughs> And it's away from the solemnity of Easter. So you can let loose. Now, <laughs> since the guilds grew with the towns, by the 14th century, the drama became divorced from the church liturgy. It was secular now, by the 14th century, and in the local language. So we're talking Middle English now. Um, not the Latin of the liturgy. Remember, Latin stayed in the Western Church until, uh, I think, 1962. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. uh, when I went with my Catholic yeah. friends to see their service, it was 1962. And it was always in the local languages, I think, for the Eastern Churches, but we're not dealing with that. But the chief subject matter of the plays remained essentially scriptural. These were known as mystery plays or miracle plays, at least that's what historians call them now. And they were performed in about 125 British communities. <laughs> and we still have some of the scripts. Englishmen never throw anything away you know, <laughs> from such towns as Chester and York and Wakefield and Coventry. Interesting, Coventry is only about 15 miles north of Stratford, and that may prove to be of some significance. Now, in order to give opportunities to all the guildsmen. Everybody wanted to show off to have their plot. The plays were mounted on wagons, and I suspect pulled by apprentices, and they would present a complete biblical cycle. In the case of York, 48 short plays. Play number one was a creation of the world, pretty good on a moving wagon, and play, uh, play 48 was Judgment Day. So they got a lot in. And because, you know, they had their share of uh, drunken tradesmen, 
uh, there was always lots of opportunity for crew <coughs> humor. Noah's wife was invariably a red-headed shrew. I suspect all the parts were played by men, but a red wig will do it. Um, uh, the shepherds in the second shepherd's play, uh, where the angel of the Annunciation comes in, uh, include a Scotsman who's a sheep thief, and they don't <laughs> trust him, because this is in York, and no Yorkshire man trusts a Scotsman. Uh, clearly, some of the plays within these large cycles, and we have a good many of them, uh, a lot of those who study medieval literature will read many of these, were written and revised by men of some talent who knew how to entertain their communities. And there is a tradition that when young Will Shakespeare was 10 years old, that would be 1574, when the mystery cycles were still being performed in a town not far from Stratford, it was probably Coventry, on Corpus Christi Day, you wonder if uh, John Shakespeare closed his leather goods shop that day and took young Will with him and went across the fields to watch the full day cycle. And when they're walking back, what do you want to do, Will, when you grow up? <laughs> uh, anyway, it's an entertaining speculation. It's nothing you can prove, but there is that tradition that's come down to us. Okay, after the mystery cycles came the morality plays. The mystery plays had dramatized the biblical text. The morality plays were dramatized sermons in which the characters were abstract personifications, generally illustrating the struggle between virtue and vice for the human soul. Uh, unlike the moving wagons, when I say moving, of course, in, in the mystery cycles, they would go to station one, put on the play for 10 minutes, and then go to station two, and if your daddy was in it, you followed him through the eight or 10 times they performed it that day. But uh, the morality plays were done stationary, often in an inn yard, by people trying to make a living, trying to pass the hat to get lion. We've, we've seen that in the 60s. Everybody had a clarinet out and was uh, uh, passing the hat. You remember even here in State East Lansing. Uh, the best one, in my opinion, that's come down to us is the 15th century play called Every Man in which God dispatches the angel of death with a summons for every man to appear in court for judgment. Mm -hmm. Every man tries to get out of it. Not today, could you wait a week? So it doesn't work. He pleads, can I take someone with me? He wants a companion. And he appeals mainly to fellowship, to kindred, to worldly goods. No, some other day maybe, but today I'm really busy. Uh, uh, finally, at his graveside, after beauty, strength, discretion, five wits, and even knowledge depart from him, every man discovers that only good deeds will descend with him into the grave and help him present his case at the throne. Uh, and that's, you can see the point of that. Do a good deed and then you pass the hat, you see. <laughs> The play is still dramatically effective. My students have done it to good effect. Uh, I've seen a professional production where every man is hit by a New York taxi. Uh, always an ever-present possibility in Manhattan if you uh, take him cabs there. And he goes down to the grave accompanied by a very piercing jazz clarinet wail. Quite a terrific production. Uh, Okay, by the time we get to the 6th century, we, 16th, we see the first permanent purpose-dedicated structure for theater built in London in 1576. <clears throat> 1576, Shakespeare was now 12 years old, <coughs> so he now will have a place to go when he leaves home. Uh, and that's in addition, of course, to the troops of traveling actors who we have records of that came through Stratford and performed in the Guildhall in Stratford. Uh, I don't have another hour to lecture on the structure of the outdoor Elizabethan amphitheater and all its versatility and intimacy. So I have a suggestion. The next time you go to London, not in the winter, you attend 
a performance at the excellently reconstructed Globe Theater on the south bank of the Thames, and there's a footbridge that goes almost right to it from the north side. And that's just, oh, a few hundred yards from where we think the original location was. They, they found the foundation of the original globe after they built this one. Sam Wanamaker, an American actor, was really the one who got this going. And it, it, it's really an excellent reconstruction, and it is still physically possible to jam in almost 3,000 spectators when you count all the groundlings who still stand around on three sides of the fresh stage. Uh, there is a somewhat outdated scale model of an Elizabethan theater in the lobby of the Passant Theater. It's something to look at in intermission. Uh, it's, it's out of date. It was built, I think, for the 1955 centennial of Michigan State University. And we've learned a lot about theater construction since. But time speeding, we must now get to the plays themselves. Shakespeare wrote in all the fashionable genres of the day. However, I've discovered that for college students, particularly undergraduate, the favorite play is Othello with its sexuality and its sexual jealousy. It's very embrace of race relations. It's truly demonic villain, Iago. Shakespeare's, I think, best villain, although it's a hot competition with Richard III, in its climactic violence. For mature audiences, like this distinguished one, uh, the favorite is often The Tempest. Probably Shakespeare's last play to be written completely by himself about the time he was leaving London to return home to Stratford. Yet, although it's really at the end of his career, with the exception of two plays on which he collaborated at, he was a script doctor, among other things. It leaves all the other plays in the great folio edition of 1623. That collection of Shakespeare's plays, edited by his old theatrical colleagues, who loved him dearly and did not wish his works to perish. As many of them would have, totally, without that collection printed just seven years after his death. <clears throat> I have a distinct memory of being asked over 20 years ago to speak to a group of Michigan judges who were approaching retirement. <laughs> they ranged through the judicial hierarchy from the Supreme Court down to local district and probate judges. I chose the Tempest as my assigned topic because it does show a person of great authority, the Duke of Milan, although when you see a production, sometimes it's Milan and sometimes it's Milan, they'll say, particularly at Stratford, and the real Stratford in England and London because it fits the metrics better. So sometimes you hear Milan and sometimes Milan, not to worry, the same city in Italy where Shakespeare had never been. Mm -hmm. uh, but it shows the Duke of Milan taking off his magical robe of power and preparing to come back to rejoin his fellow citizens like a judge leaving the bench, or a professor who takes off his mantle of authority <laughs> upon retirement. Remember, in the good old days, we literally used to wear professorial robes. We're only reminded of that at commencement now. Uh, and that professor then returns to his unranked place among the citizenry. No one cares if he retired as an assistant professor or as a full professor or with an endowed chair. Now you're going back among the citizens, no longer wielding the power of the grade. Uh, I, I do want to add that the judges always came prepared. I did this with that for several years, having done their reading in advance, and that did raise my opinion of the judicial <laughs> uh, Now, the Tempest is often spoken of as Shakespeare's fell farewell to the stage, we know that it was performed at the Royal Court of James I. Remember, Elizabeth died in 1603, then it's James. During the Christmas season of 1611, and the King's Men, they used to be the Lord Chamberlain's Men, when James came on, they became the King's Men. Royal sponsorship, and he loved the theater. So, in, during the Christmas season, they were much in demand at the Royal Court. 
uh, which is around 1611, is around the time that Shakespeare went back home to Stratford to live the comfortable and well-deserved life of a country gentleman, enjoying the visits of his London theatrical friends and the ample income from the lands he purchased with the fruits of his London success. No romantic starving artist for Shakespeare. He bought a lot of real estate, he owned 10% of, of the theatrical company, which was far and away the most successful company in England. And he invested apparently fairly wisely, as nearly as I can tell. Uh, indeed, the closing scene of the play shows the aging wizard Prospero played at Stratford, Ontario in 2010 by the great Christopher Plummer in his 81st year. He'll be back this summer doing a, a, a soliloquy he's written himself, by the way, a one-person performance. Putting aside his magical powers to return home with his daughter to see her well married in Naples and then retire me to my millen where every third thought shall be my grave. Mm -hmm. All right, the plot. First in the beginning of the story. Prospero, rightful Duke of Milan, has been living on an island for the last 12 years because his wicked younger brother Antonio took advantage of Prospero's preoccupation with his books to organize a coup and exile Prospero from his dukedom. You see, Prospero was really a professor at heart, yeah. and he wanted to study, but he was studying magic, perfectly appropriate thing of the day, not much different from alchemy after all. Uh, ever since then, Prospero and his daughter Miranda, a child of three at the time of his banishment, have lived on this enchanted island with no native population except for the supernatural spirit, Ariel, child of air, and the monster Caliban, earthy child of the witch Sycorix, who ruled the island before Prospero arrived. This is one of Shakespeare's very few plays, the only one I can think of at the moment, without a literary source. We know he got all his Romans from Plutarch. He got most of the romances from Italian novels, and of course he got the history plays from the English Chronicles of Holland, Hollandshed. This he got from current events. Just two years before the play's first performance, an English ship had been lost on its way to the Jamestown, Virginia colony, established just two years earlier, remember, in 1607. It was given up for lost, as often happened, after all, at the time. And then, miraculously, reappeared the next year. The crew, having rebuilt the ship, that had run aground on the unexpectedly delightful and previously unknown island of Bermuda. Not a bad place <laughs> yeah. to end up with a shipwreck. So popular pa pamphlets were soon, certainly they were penny pamphlets, soon published detailing that miraculous adventure. So talk of survival on tropical islands with very non-English natives was circulating widely great public interest, clearly also read by Shakespeare. Bermuda even gets a brief mention in the play as a distant place from which Ariel fetched the dew for Prospero. As the play opens, Prospero discovers that his wicked younger brother Antonio is at sea near the island along with his henchman, King Alonso of Naples, and Alonso's younger brother, Sebastian. Using his magical powers perfected on the island, Prospero sends a storm, a raging tempest, which lands the royal group on the island separately from their ship and their sailors. Prospero his Ariel torment the new arrivals, setting them to plot against each other, organizing a banquet which vanishes as soon as they try to eat. Ariel disguises himself as a spirit of revenge and tells Alonso falsely that his son Ferdinand has been drowned in order to publish, to punish Alonso's wickedness in helping Antonio to banish Prospero years earlier. Ariel also confuses the bestial Caliban 
who has made a plot with Alonso's drunken butler Stefano at court jester Trinculo to murder Prospero and make Stefano ruler of the island. The three of them staggered drunkenly about the island in their murderous plot, falling into puddles of horse piss, as they put it, which is the Three Stooges part of the play, <laughs> of which there were many in Shakespearean comedy, and other misadventures arranged by Ariel while they bewail their love. Actually, Ferdinand has been drowned by his fallen in love with the beautiful Miranda, and she with him, all deliberately arranged by Prospero, who sets Ferdinand to hard labor, lest Miranda seem too easily gained. Uh, an old-fashioned father. <laughs> Prospero is sufficiently moved by their honest affection to arrange a betrothal mask, M-A-S-Q-U-E, an aristocratic allegorical entertainment common in the English Renaissance in which supernatural spirits bless the young couple. They won't get married till they get back to civilization and they have to hold on to their passions until then. He's very clear about that. But Prospero discovers Caliban's conspiracy against him and interrupts the mask to deal with that conspiracy. Ariel, who's all spirit, pleads with Prospero to show mercy to all those who conspired against him, and therefore pity at last softens Prospero's vengeful heart. In a series of great speeches, he voluntarily gives up his magical powers, frees Ariel from service, pardons all those whom he had caused to be cast onto the island, regains his dukedom, and prepares, prepares to return to Milan in the new spirit of forgiveness and generosity which the plays events have wrought in him. This may be Shakespeare's only play that follows the so-called three Aristotelian unities of time, place, and action. Usually he's all over the place. All the events occur on one afternoon. All the action occurs on this small island except for the opening shipwreck scene just offshore, and is just one main plot of reconciliation with, of course, a single comic subplot of the rebellion of Caliban, Stefano, and Trinco. That's it. It's actually a basically simple plot, which I got through in about six minutes. <laughs> um, Prospero. Let's talk about the character. Uh, the name is kind of a giveaway. He is intended to prosper, after all, ultimately. He is a central figure. He's in charge of this whole island plantation experiment. He is essentially the god of the island, exemplifying the Baconian thesis. Remember Francis Bacon? A thesis very dear to us professors, that what? Knowledge is power. Uh, in a sense, Prospero encompasses Shakespeare's own comprehensive imagination and creative identity. He's a creature of art, not of nature. In the course of the play, he learns about love and forgiveness and the graduated variety of human nature. He arranges a marriage of reconciliation for his daughter with Ferdinand Alonso's son, and at the end is ready I hope, like the rest of us, ready to resume his place in society, wiser, more humane, having gained self-knowledge, which is one of the place principal preoccupations, self-knowledge. There are a number of great set speeches by Prospero which express this theme of leaving the island, casting aside one's magical powers, like the professor's lectern, the surgeon's scalpel, talk to doctors too, the judge's robe, the London playwright's pen, and rejoining common humanity. For example, when the patrol, when the patrol so mask is interrupted by Caliban's murderous plot, our rebels now are ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits, and are melted into air into thin air, and like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself 
Yea, all which it inherits shall dissolve, and like this insubstantial faded, leave not a wreck behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. The play is essentially a commentary on the whole man, the island, including its newly shipwrecked visitors, reveals a microcosm of all of humanity, from the almost angelic Ariel to the almost bestial Caliban, with all the variations in between. There was a term that scholars like to use in the 20s and 30s called the great chain of being, and uh, it's not in fashion now, but this is an illustration of that. Prospero has become the ideal ruler through his 12 years of island exile. Prudent, fraternal, and finally, forgiving. He's no longer the man who lost his throne because he loved his books more than his human responsibilities. So Shakespeare thus closes his career with a comedy of forgiveness, the necessary rejoining with comedy, with common humanity. Miranda. She is innocence personified. You could say she's been homeschooled. She only knows her father from the age of three, now 15 after 12 years. She's been carefully nurtured on the island by her father, <coughs> Prospero, her only teacher. But her education cannot be complete until she meets Ferdinand. I guess uh, that was the uh, justification for making the dorms co-ed. <laughs> After all, she is now 15 years old. Remember, Juliet was almost 14. And this meeting has been artfully arranged by her father. Her name comes from the Latin group Morari. Still does, if you know any modern Mirandas. Morari, to marvel, to wonder at. When she sees her first group of men, which includes two attempted murderers, as well as the men who set her and her father adrift on a leaky boat 12 years earlier, she ecstatically proclaims, Oh, wonder! How many goodly creatures are there here? How beauteous mankind is! Oh, brave new world that has such people in it! And Prospero, who's learned from bitter experience, responds, "'Tis new to thee." <laughs> Her innocence represents the natural force of love, and that will ultimately have its effect on Prospero. Excuse me, I'm losing a voice here. Ferdinand. Ferdinand is Prince Charming. He is the young heir to the throne of Naples. Just as Miranda has grown up to be totally unlike her father, so he's utterly unlike his father, Alonso, the corrupted king of Naples, who had lent his support to Antonio's overthrow of Prospero in order for Milan to pay tribute to Naples. Ferdinand happily performs manual labor assigned by Prospero to show his love for Miranda. The same tests that Caliban performs only with curses and grumbling. Ariel. He, she, I've seen Ariel played by males. You should usually I think the first one I saw was Roddy McDowell. I don't know if any of you remember Roddy <laughs> McDowell. But he was my first Ariel at Stratford, Connecticut, which for some years had a very, very good experience. That, but it, it was too far from the city, I guess, and uh, it folded. Uh, I've seen it played by women, and I've seen it played by actors whose gender I couldn't quite make up. <laughs> and I guess that's appropriate for Ariel. <laughs> Certainly the opposite polarity from Caliban. Ariel is all airy spirit, and Prospero's main agent of rough magic in carrying out the tasks of justice 
and reconciliation. <laughs> Rough magic is magic that affects the material world, that makes things happen. None of the, and it's a term that's often used in the play, none of the characters, apart from Prospero, ever sees Ariel. I mean, we the audience see Ariel, but none of the characters see them. Remember the shadow in the old days? Uh, Prospero, when he arrived on the island, had set Ariel free from his imprisonment within a pine tree for having displeased the witch Sycorax. That's Caliban's mother. But then Prospero held Ariel with new bonds of service which Ariel accepts with good cheer, but longs to be entirely free. And that for scene one, just after Prospero has finally agreed to the engagement of Miranda and Ferdinand, he tells Ariel to prepare a mask for that aristocratic entertainment for the happy couple. And Ariel happily agrees to do it instantly. But then Ariel asks of Prospero, do you love me, Master? Prospero pauses before answering. So Ariel Trouble asks, No? And Prospero only then reassuringly responds, Dearly, my delicate Ariel, by first hesitating, then realizing he does, in fact, love Ariel, Prospero shows that through the agency of Ariel, he's ready to forgive his enemies, even his rotten brother, and rejoin his human connections. Ariel has compassion for the victims of Prospero's magic, and ultimately induces Prospero also to feel pity for the human condition. Ariel says to Prospero, your charm so strongly works him that if you now beheld them, your affections would become tender. Dost thou think so, spirit? Mine would, sir, were I human. Remember the Dr. Spock from the original Star Trek series, mm -hmm. who's often puzzled by the emotions of humans which he cannot feel. This is Ariel. This polar opposite, Caliban. Caliban is sometimes compared to the English colonist view of the American Indian. Damn difficult, frightening, got to be controlled. In fact, in Shakespeare's list of characters at the beginning of the play, Caliban is labeled as a savage and deformed slave. Now, maybe a prompt to put that in there. We can't be sure that that's Shakespeare's description, but there it is in the first folio, a savage and deformed slave. His very name, in fact, is an anagram for cannibal. That's easy. Okay. He is all nature without nurture. A condition often true of Shakespeare's view of the mob in his political plays like Julius Caesar, Coriolanus. In Prospero's dismissive phrases, Caliban is a thing of darkness, a born devil on whose nature nurture can never stick, thus revealing Shakespeare to be a biological determinist, like Professor Wilson at Harvard has just come up with another book about biological determinism. In that nature versus nurture argument, Caliban is the offspring of a witch, Sycorax, and a devil. Not a very nice family. <laughs> He's all earth in contrast to Ariel's all spirit. Unlike Ariel, the grossly corporeal Caliban is unpleasingly visible to everybody. I think that he is what Aristotle in his politics called a natural slave. One incapable, there are legal slaves in Aristotle, say, but they're also natural slaves. One incapable, and I've met a few, I think, one incapable of rational self-determination. In addition, of course, for being almost the entire play, the literal slave. Uh, he is liberated at the end, but the literal slave of Prospero. And I think maybe in modern psychological terms, Caliban is that untamed Freudian id in all of us. He is that libidinal inner self which wants to get out, maybe at football games or English soccer games. Of course, that of course 
would make Prospero the controlling superego, if you want to get Freud. It, it is, unfortunately, the current fashion to cast Caliban sympathetically as an almost lovable, hairy, ineffectual, sad sack. BBC version, which had tremendous influence on it. A few years ago, the show on television everywhere uh, has him that way. But I prefer, and I think it's more accurate to cast him in, like the first Caliban I ever saw, Jack Palance. I don't know if you remember Jack Palance. <laughs> yeah, uh, me. Like uh, we're all old enough to remember Jack Palance. He played football at Stanford, and he was quite frighteningly ugly, particularly as Caliban. Almost naked, jumping with menacing gestures about the stage. For those of our politically correct uh, colleagues, and there are many uh, who prefer to see Caliban as purely a victim of predatory colonialism, and I've had to sit through learned papers like that where I was moved down and I raised objections to that very fashionable current critical view. They'll have to overlook his attempted rape of Miranda, his attempted murder of Prospero, his stupid uh, I'm sorry, his superstitious, it was also stupid, his superstitious worship of the drunken Stefano as a god. The, the politically correct in this play would have to approve a bloody rebellion that would install a government of fools and drunkards. Paradoxically, Caliban, who has been taught language by Prospero, has some of the most naturally poetic speeches in the play. Be not afeard, he tells Stefano Trinco. Be not afeard. The aisle is full of noises, sounds, and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will hum about mine ears, and sometimes voices that if I then had waked after long sleep will make me sleep again. And then in dreaming the clouds, the thought would open and show riches ready to drop upon me. That when I waked, I cried to dream again. And yet, in Caliban's opening scene, he brags to Prospero's disgust. You taught me language, and my prophet on it is I know how to curse the red plague, rid you for learning me your language. Thus, him, <laughs> Caliban, exemplifies the desire, sorry, Caliban, now to per the desire to pervert that like language which could be used for the good. Excuse me. <clears throat> the here. Antonio. He is Prospero's usurping younger brother and an active force for evil with his envy, ambition, and malice. He's one of the few people, maybe the only person, cast on the island who is apparently unchanged by its magic. If he goes back to Milan with Prospero, then Prospero should mind his back. Antonio is a rather sad commentary on civilization when this is its result. <laughs> Sebastian. Better not do Caliban again. <clears throat> Sebastian. He is the younger brother of Alonso, king of Naples, very easily manipulated by Antonio. Sebastian is not so much actively evil is easily seduced into evil by his own moral weakness. For example, in Act 2, Scene 1, just after they have been tempest-tossed on the island, Sebastian gets, I'm sorry, Antonio gets Sebastian to agree to the murder of his own brother, Alonso, in order to gain the crown of Naples. And of course, that would also relieve Antonio from having to pay tribute to Naples. That murderous plot is, of course, easily thwarted by Prospero and Ariel. A, a quick personal reminiscence. When I got out of the army and decided to go back to graduate school, sorry, microphone, 
decided to go back to graduate school, felt a little rough, a little insecure, and I, I signed up for Shakespeare course, and a very distinguished professor asked me, after all, to be his graduate assistant. That meant, uh, you yeah, know, I graded the quizzes and the exams and took attendance, but uh, he did all the lecturing in the great old Rafter uh, lecture hall. And one day I uh, had my quizzes graded and was going to deliver them with comments to Professor Zeal. Oops. And uh, uh, I sat down in his open office and I heard a commotion in the hall. And I see this professor who always, very tall, always impeccably dressed in a dark suit and, uh, and had a Van Dyke beard. Clearly not what I was used to in my army days. And uh, I heard a commotion and he comes literally dragging into the room a quivering pimply faced undergraduate and throws him into a chair. Those were the good old days. <laughs> and then says to unaware of my presence in the room, and says to Sir, do you see any reason why I should not fail you in this course? And the fellow said something well, well I thought he was going to wet himself. It was so terrible. Apparently he'd been caught cheating. Uh, you know, flunking exam is one thing, but to cheat, he succumbed to temptation to cheat. And he, whatever he said, it was inarticulate. And he says, OUT! And then only then does he notice my presence. He turns to me and says, Ah, Mr. Gotchberg, there are many Sebastians in this room. <laughs> many Sebastians. Fortunately, I had read The Tempest, <laughs> and I understood. I had a dear old colleague, Maureen Crane, who would always ask me, are you sure he, when I told that story to him, he said, you sure he didn't say something else that sounded like Sebastian? <laughs> but uh, I assured Maureen that it was absolutely Sebastian. And I suppose when you think about Sebastian's susceptibility is very appropriate. And I'm sure utterly terrified. I don't know what happened to the undergraduate. I never saw him again from <laughs> ran off and never to be found. Uh, Gonzalo. Gonzalo is the honest old counselor in the court of Naples, who sometimes speaks as if he is the new Virginian plantation developer. He has, Gonzalo has a very optimistic view of this new world of the island and probably represents the French philosopher Montaigne's view of the Indians as noble savages. That was a phrase that you got in a lot of French literature. He wrote an essay called Of the Cannibals. Uh, that view does not correspond to the reality of Caliban. Uh, Montaigne's essay was translated by John Florio in 1603 and there's no doubt that Shakespeare knew it was very readily available in London. This optimism is used, that is that Montaigne-like optimism, is used to render explicit an essential theme of self-knowledge in Gonzalo's final speech of the play. Was Milan thrust from Milan that his issue should become kings of Naples? Or rejoice beyond a common joy and set it down with gold on lasting pillars in one voyage did Clarabel, her husband, find a Tunis, and Ferdinand, her brother, found a wife where he himself was lost. Prospero, his dukedom, in a poor isle, and all of us ourselves, when no man was his own, that is, his own master. Finally, Stefano the drunken butler and Trinculo Alonso's court, just as they represent the lowest element possible within civilized society. Their motives are resentment against proper authority and personal profit. They provide the slapstick comic elements. They manage to stay drunk most of the play with a cask of wine that Stefano had saved from the ship. And they eagerly follow Caliban in his plot against Prospero to make the drunken Stefano king of the island. Oh, in summation, then. this is Shakespeare's last look at what constitutes the civilized man. 
its significance as Shakespeare's philosophical summary and farewell may very well be indicated by its leading position in the great folio of 1623, the first collection of his plays. The plot on this island, which is inhabited only by the characters in the play, gives people a chance to act as if they are not being observed by society. That is, even though they are really under Prospero's control, they do not know it and act under conditions of apparent absolute free will. That's what you tell the person really is. And I have this memory moving here in August of 65, 1965, not 1865. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, being asked, I had four children at that point. Joan and I slept under the grand piano and gave the bedroom to the kids, if you can remember Cherry Lane. <laughs> if we would mind bringing our younger children uh, to Olds Hall, uh, where the psychology department was then located. Yeah. I, I don't think it's there now. And uh, I did, not wanting to say no to anything I was asked. I've been here only a few months. And uh, uh, I discovered that there was a room with a one-way mirror, and that there were a number of children in that room. And they were all put on one side of the mirror and could not see to the other side totally unaware that there what appeared to be a lot of graduate students in child psychology taking <laughs> on the behavior of the children. Yeah. They were put in, there were sandboxes, there were slides, there were slides and uh, shovels, and, but not quite enough for all the children that were asked to come. Hopefully if one a little boy began to beat someone with a shovel, someone would interfere, but I'm not so sure. They were all very busy taking notes. And I, that was, well, that's the island of Prospero, uh, if you will. They don't know that they're really being observed, so they act as they would without their parents, without God watching. Uh, so we have here a demonstration of various forms of control including the possibility of self-control. We must note that there is no natural nobility in the island apart from society, neither Caliban nor Sycorax nor Ariel. We must go back to civilization and do the best with what we have. Unlike Miranda, Prospero who becomes, in the course of the play, the truly civilized man, has no illusions about this brave new world. Unlike Montaigne or Gonzalo, Shakespeare finds no utopia elsewhere. There's no Woodstock, there's no Walden. One must, like Shakespeare, be in society. And the whole play is a preparation for return. Repentant, forgiving, and forgiven. A bit wiser, ready to start anew. Man is a mixture and must struggle within himself. That's the true tempest. That's what it's all about. The internal struggle of Antonio and Caliban against Ariel and Prospero within each of us. That's what Shakespeare's saying here. After all, how does the play begin if not with a tempest, both out in nature and within the soul of Prospero? Remember that in Shakespeare, all great storms are both literal and metaphorical. Remember King Lear lost in going mad out on the stormy heath? This play begins with all the ingredients of a revenge tragedy. But typical of Shakespeare is turned at the last moment into a comedy of forgiveness and of rejoining with humanity, thus making Crossbro the ideal ruler and man through his experience and by implication all of us who by the rough magic of Shakespeare's stagecraft experience that same acceptance and forgivingness along with him. And now, just as Prospero concludes the play, let your indulgence set me free. <laughs> Thank you.
guess exactly an hour, so I guess I stay within the Aristotelian limit. <laughs>